Welcome, friends and music lovers. Today, I'm going to share my lifelong companion with you. And that is my beautiful cello. And this cello is, is quite extraordinary, which you'll find out. I'm going to try to relay its, some of its history, which from 1705 is considerable. 315 years of history in a couple of minutes. Um, many of us um, are lucky that we know some of the history of the instruments we play. In this case, this old Italian instrument, I have uh, knowledge from about 1913 to the present day. Now, all the members of our string quartet have old Italian instruments, so we're very, very fortunate. Um, I feel um, like this is a, a gift of my voice for the rest of my life. This is my musical voice coming through this instrument. And its name is Francesco Goffriller, who worked with his uncle in the shop uh, of Matteo Goffriller, who's one of the great cello makers in the world. In fact, Janusz Starker, Pablo Casals, that level of musician had Matteo Grafillers. Uh, because he was working in the same shop for many years, we see the same kind of varnish and the same aesthetic of a beautiful rich bass and a sweet top, as many Italian singers have. Now, uh, as you can see, we have a different grain on the back, and this is poplar, which is um, unusual. Uh, instruments are usually spruce and maple. And one of the features of this instrument, made in 1705, it didn't have an end pin at that time. Church musicians would walk around Venice, where it was made, with this attached to the bell. This hole had a peg in it, and uh, it was could have been marching around with Vivaldi and his orchestra. This was the same time that Vivaldi, Corelli, all these great Italian master composers were writing, so who knows. But to tell you a little bit more of the history since 1913, we have here a diary of the man who owned my cello from 1913 to 1948. His name was Alexander Barjanski, and his wife, a famous sculptress, kept a record, a diary, of all their activities uh, for about a decade from 1913. And so in this book um, tells the tales of, of many meetings with princes and intelligentsia in Europe as well as great musicians such as Izai, which he was a great friend with. And he would have played this instrument uh, for weeks on end uh, chamber in chamber music with Izai. Another extraordinary historical event with this cello was that in 1915, Barjanski played for Ernest Bloch. And along with his wife, who uh, brought a, sculpt, uh, a sculpture of King David, uh, Ernest Bloch was inspired to write the famous Shalomo for cello. So that piece was directly inspired by this cello. And I thought it would be interesting to read a page from a book about Delius, uh, whose works uh, Barjanski uh, premiered, for instance, the Cello Concerto. Here's an account of an evening with Barjanski from this book. The greater part of the following day was spent in vigorous rehearsal, and I was much amused by Barjanski, who would practice like a demon for an hour or so, and then suddenly stop and say, Fenby, I must now take my repose. Bathed in perspiration, he would then retire behind his cello case, strip, dry his shirt before the stove, and fleeing himself in a state of great exhaustion on the divan would smoke the vilest cigarettes imaginable. Well, after these years with Barjanski, my companion then uh, came into the hands of the famous uh, quartet cellist David Sawyer. In 1961, 
the cello came into the hands of the great Latvian cellist, Lev Aronson, who ended up residing in Dallas, Texas, uh, as the principal cellist of the Dallas Symphony for over 25 years, and a great teacher, the teacher of Lynn Harrell, who just passed away, Ralph Kirschbaum, among, among others. Lev Aronson had uh, tragic circumstances throughout his life, being a Jew, first in Riga and then in Germany. He was in three concentration camps and escaped them all as a seamstress. But when he finally got to America after the war, he had no money, and Piatigorsky helped him get into the country. In fact, Piatigorsky helped him purchase the instrument I have now. And um, it says in this book about Lev Aronson, who lost two Amatis during the war, had to give them up to his colleagues who weren't Jewish in the orchestra. With a heavy heart, Lev turned to Piatigorsky, who helped him finance his beloved Gefriller, the cello he played to the end of his life. And um, it says in here that the last years of his life he played this cello. It had a dark, profound sound projecting out before falling down. In that way, one of his students told me the instrument was very much like he was. You couldn't win an argument with Lev. I've been told that in his house, Lev always left one latch of his cello case undone. Asked why, he replied, well, that's how it can breathe. So this is an idea of just how fortunate I feel, being uh, much less famous, but maybe as appreciative of all these cellists that have come before me. There's not a moment in my life where I don't want to take up the cello and listen to the beautiful sound of it and feel fortunate for my fate.